Hi, my name is Natalia Edwards and I'm here today with David Silver. We are from Christian Hansen and we want to talk about fermentation redefined, which is an interesting subject for us where we can combine heritage and innovation in one big box. So who is Christian Hansen and how did we get to where we are? Well, we were actually founded in 1874, where the focus was on the dairy industry and first on the rennet. Then quickly that moved into fermentation and controlling fermentation, having good fermentations. And in 1974, we introduced what we call a DVS, so that's direct vat set, meaning that we had ready to pitch cultures that you could directly pitch into your cheese vats. That then quickly expanded to other foods and beverages, and in 93, we entered the wine industry with malolactic cultures to have secure and fast malolactic fermentation. From then on, we found it interesting to dive into yeast and what they can do, especially non-saccharomyces yeast that could be used to make different flavors and textures in the wine and just increasing the complexity in general. That then led us into beer, thinking what could we do there? First focusing on non-alcoholic beer, working with the Pika Clurie, that can give you all the flavours, but no alcohol produced. That was then a natural step to say, well, what can we use these kind of technologies and these special yeast for in other interesting beverages? So now we're exploring a large variety of beverages and we can do even more, we believe, in the future. So why are we here today? Well, it's actually because a lot of good things are fermented uh, and that's why we love fermentation. Um, my background is actually in wine and winemaking. And in that field, I quickly found out that fermentation, well, that's really the key of making things interesting and complex. If you think about a wine, you have these grapes, they have a nice fruity character, but it's really the fermentation that makes it into a wine, creates this complexity, both flavor-wise and texture and differentiates the wines, makes all wines different. You can take the same grapes, but if you ferment them differently, you'll have a different product. So taking that kind of mindset into other fermented beverages, you can really start exploring and making delicious things with all sorts of bases. Yeah, um, a little bit about myself. I am a chef by trade and always have been since uh, I was just a teenager. Um, and throughout my entire career in the culinary arts, working at fine dining restaurants uh, back in North America, uh, or whether it was here in Europe, uh, where uh, working at you know really high caliber restaurants like Restaurant Noma uh, or Geranium, you know, fermentation has always played very large into that role. Uh, but it probably wasn't until I was at Noma where it became a very you know, basically full-time focus uh, for me uh, into its investigation, into its exploration, into understanding just how microbes can transform food in completely innovative and and kind of uh, groundbreaking ways, basically. Um, in that work, I really started to discover the, the manifold ways that fermentation can be applied um, with a traditional mindset to very untraditional means, uh, whether those are solid foods, like the things that we uh, consume for, for lunch and dinner, or whether they're you know juices or you know interesting beverages that have the capacity to completely wow and bowl people over uh, for the unexpected flavors and dimensions that fermentation and microbes can bring to the table. So that's why I love fermentation, uh, and you know after 20 years working with food, uh, I'm diving into it even more and more with Christian Hansen. So fermentation, it comes with a lot of heritage. There's so many different fermented foods out there, as David also just mentioned, already existing. But we also think with our knowledge that we have today, after these 145 years of fermenting, we can use it as a tool to really create innovating beverages out there. So you can take something, transform it completely, using these really old techniques. It's kind of one of the oldest things in the book, to ferment something to preserve the foods. But now we can really use it to create a story and create really unique flavors out there. So if we think of something like we already know, everyone knows the dairy, the fermented dairies. You know your yogurt, you know your cheeses, and that's lactic acid bacteria. No one's questioning if it has alcohol or not. It's also perceived fairly healthy by most people, the majority. Um, and then on the other side, we you know, have the alcoholic beverages that we know, our beers, our wines. And that's also fermented, but there we see the fermentation as something giving the complexity and giving it this more adult uh, palette to it. Um, 
So why not explore what's in between these two? What can be done if we combine these two worlds? So we can think lactic acid bacteria, we can think fermentation without alcohol, but getting the complexity that we know from these adult alcoholic beverages. Um, that's the space that we really want to dive into today and try to inspire you what can be done. And this is, we believe it's quite new, but actually it's not that new. There's loads of non-alcoholic uh, fermented beverages out there. So we can take even take inspiration of some of the beverages we already know, it being uh, tapache or kombucha, there's many options. Some of them don't always have a completely appealing taste to the modern consumer, so they may, may need a little redefining or a little twist to them to really make them fit into the modern consumer landscape, but that's for sure possible. So either we can think completely new, or we can use something traditional and give it a twist. And. You know, that's uh, where, in my experience, I know for a fact that almost anything edible can be fermented. You know, whether those are legumes, grains, seeds, vegetation, from the fruits to roots to leaves, uh, or animals, from fish or insects or the products they make, like milk or honey or, you know, the saps that they harvest. Fermentation is a practice that predates humanity itself. It's helped to build the civilizations that we call our homes all over the world. Whether that was in the cradle of East Africa 10,000 years ago, or today in a city like Copenhagen, New York, London, wherever you might be. It is absolutely ubiquitous and inextricably linked to the human endeavor. It's currently estimated that about a third of all the foods that people eat today on Earth are transformed by microbes at some point in their process. from you know, the point of production to entering someone's mouth. That's a huge amount of transformation that happens at the hands of microbes like yeast and bacteria that directly affect what we put into our bodies and how we perceive those foods to be. The foods we consider everyday staples in our diets, in our pantries, are, for the most part, fermented items, whether that's breakfast, lunch, or for dinner. They fly under the radar as fermented foods because they've just become so ubiquitously part of our daily lives that we kind of forget that there was a microbe involved in their production at all. Whether those are, you know, grain-based products like breads, baguettes, or sourdough loaves, or even sweet treats like donuts that you might get from a gas station, um, or pastries like uh, croissants. Those can also extend into uh, the dairies that Natalia just mentioned, yogurts, cream cheeses, creme fraiche, um, or things that you might even think uh, that you take out of a, a grocery store on a quick lunch, be that you know, the, the mustard vinaigrette for a salad dressing, um, or the soy sauce or miso that you might have from a, a sushi restaurant. All of these things are fermented and better for it at the hands of microbes that completely transform them into new categories of flavors and, and foodstuffs. The list goes on and on and on once you really dive into it. So it's just natural to think that, well, if there's so many foods that we already consume that are fermented, that are improved, why can't we take some of those ideas, some of those pathways, and apply them to spaces where fermentation doesn't traditionally have a role, but it absolutely could? When you view fermentation not as an archaic or niche or fringe cultural practice, not something that just happens at, you know, the kind of hippie farmer's market, you know, on a, on a Sunday uh, every other week, you can really kind of open up to the manifold possibilities that you can extract from fermentation for these reasons. Ranges of flavors and even textures um, in the products that you look towards uh, aren't just simple one-to-one -one transactions. It's not like throwing a microbe in to, as Natalia said, a vat of wine just gives you grape juice and alcohol. That would actually be a pretty boring product. You get a whole range of flavors, a whole range of metabolites that feed back into these cycles to produce a panoply of different flavors and tastes and aromas. And once you realize that there's all sorts, all manners of different microbes and yeasts and bacteria that aren't necessarily producing alcohol, you understand that you'll get these added benefits along with the ride. It's just part and parcel with the, uh, the practice of fermentation. It's never just sugar goes to your final product, whether that's lactic acid or alcohol or acetic acid. You always get these amazing transformations that you would be very hard pressed to replicate by any other means. 
So what is fermentation actually? Just to be sure that we're all on the same page, we thought just to say what it is. So fermentation is actually this anaerobic microbial conversion of a compound to something else. And the reason it's happening is for the microbe to survive. So we have to remember that it's not always just to create these great products for us. It's, that it's actually there to try and survive in these conditions. So what does it do? It takes a carbon source of some sort, a sugar, and converts it into something else that often isn't fermentable. It can be an organic acid, it can be alcohol, different things in there. But something that's actually quite stable because most other microbes will not be able to ferment that. And then it's of course this flavour alteration. As David just mentioned, it's never just one clean chemical reaction. The fermentation, because it's a microbe and a living organism, it will have all these side metabolisms going on that creates this uniqueness and really gives this complexity that we know in wine and beer and other fermented products. But finally, we have to remember again, historically, it's all about stability. And actually, like fermented foods were discovered way before mankind had any idea that there was something called a microorganism. It was just empirical observation that when storing a food in a certain way, we had these desirable changes and it gave it these special characteristics. Um, so it was all about shelf life and, and safety at the beginning, probably trial and error. Um, but at the end, they got a really good product that was safe and had a, an appealing taste to them. Today, I think it's safe to say that fermentation has shifted in focus. It's more about creating nice flavors, as David has been doing um, at Restaurant Noma and other places like that. But it's also a healthy appeal to a lot of modern consumers mm -hmm. because of this naturalness and this old heritage saying, you know, it's, not, it's always been there. So this is kind of what we are trying to build on. It's, it's all this knowledge that has been built up on centuries. And it's only like even Wolf Pasteur that found out, oh, there's bacteria. And from then on, then we could start controlling them. And for us, it's really now about you can actually, with knowledge, you can start controlling these fermentations to get the desired product you want. And it can even be reproducible if we know how to do it. And that's why our focus is on these pure cultures often, or blended cultures, where we know how they're going to react, and we work with getting them to react in certain ways in different bases. So David is going to inspire you of which bases that could be a little later, and talk about the flavors that we can get from fermentation. Yeah. So, I mean, um, when you think that, okay, a microbe goes into your base product, whether there's a sugar source there with flavors that you chose to add, be it a steep tea or something like a, a juice extract, those basic organic molecules transform again and again in a cascade of microbial fermentation processes. Simple starting materials become very complex finished end products, and that's the beauty of it. It can't be understated that the nuance, the, the, um, the texture of something, the minutia that you get from uh, a fermentation process just makes any other sort of, you know, additive recipe pale in comparison to that, I guess you could just say a je ne sais quoi of, you know, the, the, of interest once it enters someone's mouth. They understand that there was a, a very complicated natural process going on that creates a flavor that just can't be attained by adding distillates and extracts to uh, a liquid base. The combinations of bacteria or fungal species that work together uh, as primary and adjunct cultures, as Centalia just mentioned, um, offers first complementary and um, secondary and tertiary characteristics to your finished ferments. It's unachievable by any other means. There is a synergy that works between these microorganisms, and that's why Christian Hansen is so incredibly specialized at combining different bacteria, combining different types of cultures together to create these effects that are larger than the sum of their parts. And beyond the metabolites that are produced by the microbes, the cells themselves actually offer something to your finished fermentation process. You'll never be able to call up an ingredient company and ask for the proteins that might make up a yeast cell or you know, the enzymes that the bacteria themselves use to live in their life cycles. You don't think about those as actual ingredients in a product when you turn over a label and see bacterial culture, but they are there 
And I can tell from experience, you know, the difference between adding refined lactic acid powder to an ingredient to make something that's akin to a traditional ferment like uh, kvass or kefir, if you will, just doesn't even come close to the things that you're missing from having a living microbe having gone through that product itself. Finally, when we're talking about the flavors of fermentation and what they mean to a consumer, what they mean to someone who actually wants to enjoy them, we have to also understand that these microbes have evolved with us over the course of human history. We have actually become attuned to their needs, to their byproducts, to their metabolites, and then to ours. Flavors of deliciousness are directly linked to microbial byproducts, whether those are the ones inside us or the ones that grow in our food. There is a blurring of the boundary, and when you remove those, you're missing something that can't be replaced any other way. So it is also important to think that, well, if alcohol has been produced in almost every society on earth, if, if almost every culture on earth has found a way to ferment grains or seeds and create some form of a beer or, or some form of a, a, a fermented dairy product, that there's probably a good reason why we keep going back to those flavors. So it is also fascinating to consider that there is this evolutionary link between the microbes that live in our foods and the fermented foods that we eat and why we enjoy them at all. So to talk about uh, how to bring fermentation into uh, modern beverages, to take that tradition and apply it non-traditionally, we've made this kind of fun little chart, a little exercise if you will, looking at those traditional beverages and the microbes that produce them and our modern conceptions of the non-alcoholic beverage landscape. Colas and sodas, for example, things that we all understand um, you know, uh, across the range of large producers and all the different variations of those standard rhythms that you know, general consumers know and love. If we look through all the different places that you could find microbes in traditional ferments and apply those to colas and sodas, we find whole new manners of products being created. You know, imagining uh, the acetic acid bacteria that are profligate in kombucha, creating um, different layers of acidity that then play with the carbonic acid from carbonation. You end up with something much more complex uh, that feels grown up at once as being, you know, very differentiated from people's modern understandings. Lactic acid bacteria can create things like savory sodas, imagining, you know, Eastern European products like kvass becoming much more adult when mixed with uh, other fruit juices, or other flavors, uh, and just the tiniest amount of salt to make something that feels much more appropriate as a carbonated beverage at dinner time, um, where you know someone across the table might be enjoying a sparkling wine, a fermented sparkling soda could compete uh, without bringing alcohol into the picture. And then of course, non-alcoholic aromatic yeasts like the cloveri that Christian Hansen produces um, create lots of deep, natural, fruity flavors without actually needing to resort to tropical fruits. You end up with the complexity that you find in the Sauvignon Blancs of New Zealand without the acidity or uh, even necessarily the alcohol that comes with it. Fruit juices, fruit-based kombuchas are a whole other category that buy away from tea that can be at once um, as enjoyable, uh, again, at dinner um, being paired with very fancy dishes, things that would normally be served in restaurants, and you have something that can compete with wine without being an alcoholic beverage itself. Lactic acid bacteria in fruit juices um, make much more palatable versions of those heavy-handed kind of Eastern European style of fermented drinks, um, but offer all sorts of amazing kind of um, delicious mouthfeel and, and, and um, satiation because of the acids that are produced. Um, and again, you know, applying non-alcoholic yeast to fruit juices creates all manners of flavors, basically a, an explosion of dimensionality uh, that you wouldn't be able to get from these juices any other way. Smoothies then, you know, a last category. You can see sharp tones produced with acetic acid or lactic acid that actually play with the viscosity of the thing. Um, it allows you to ferment vegetable ingredients into things that people will recognize are helpful for them and incorporate those into recipes in ways um, that just you know standard formulations would never be able to achieve. Uh, and in non-alcoholic uh, yeasts, you find the ability to achieve tropical-like fruit flavors 
um, with just simple manipulations and fermentation schedules um, that will allow you to create amazing flavors without having to resort to expensive, you know, thick tropical fruits. So there is so much there in this kind of like mixing and matching, even combining some of these cultures like lactic acid bacteria, like those non-alcoholic yeasts together to create things that are far, far more than the sum of their parts. Yeah, when we do that combination, we start seeing different synergies happening. And, and a good example is, is, is beetroot juice mm -hmm. that has a quite a heritage of fermenting, but it's, it's a heavy product. It has these earthy characters. Yeah, um, but, you know, we, we've seen that we can ferment that with lactic acid bacteria and this non-alcoholic yeast, and we get these berry flavors, and we're masking the heaviness of the beetroot and just having the nice flavors of the beetroot or more appealing flavors maybe of the beetroot. And I think it should also be mentioned, like, this is just a simple two-dimensional thing we've uh, set up here, mm -hmm. but there's so many more layers that you can add to that. And, and think, you know, teas, for example, the astringency you get from a tea just makes it more of an, an adult experience. We know that mouthfeel from other beverages, uh, but it could be coffee as well. It could be cereal basis. Um, if the dimensions are keep on going to what you can do here. It really is limitless. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So, at the end of the day, you can view fermentation as a natural solution, a natural means of changing flavors um, that's never going to kind of, you know, raise alarm bells in a consumer's mind. Fermentation confers intrinsic benefits just by its very nature that instill it with um, the unique capacity among the plethora of different techniques and processes within the beverage landscape to do what it does um, with its own special brand of understanding. Yeah, and it's, uh, we've put up here awareness, transparency and clean label because that's also what fermentation can bring. So it looks like that the consumers are being more and more interested and curious when it comes to fermented and what can be done with that. And there's not a lot of very negative voices out there when it comes to the concept of fermentation in general. Everyone's seeing it as it's fairly exciting. Um, there may be special drinks that you don't prefer, but it doesn't mean that fermentation itself can't create something really unique. So I think on that space of awareness, that's really growing uh, for fermentation at the moment. Um, and let's see where it goes. Um, social media means that things grow very fast these days. Um, so, but what we want to say, it is not just a niche concept that only the elite foodies know of. It's, it's growing, definitely. Transparency. So fermentation really allows you for an honest communication about the process that's behind your product. And, and consumers will trust this fermentation, again, because of the awareness and they're starting to know what it is. Um, so it can kind of gain the trust to your product and you can also go for quite a clean label. It is really possible to create some clean label beverages, meaning you have your basic ingredients, that being a tea with sugar or coconut water or a beetroot juice or carrot juice, and you ferment that and you will have an interesting, complex, fairly stable product as well, um, giving you that clean label at the same time. Um, that's kind of what we think we can do here in this space. So our message today has been, you know, be curious and we think you should start fermenting. Um, if you're interested in that, we are here to partner up with you in that journey to create some delicious experiences out there using fermentation, either it being redefined, taking some existing beverages, giving it a twist or pushing boundaries and coming out with something completely new for the beverage industry. So uh, you can catch us here on the platform as well. We'll be in the, the booth where you can chat and set up meetings or contact us later when appropriate. Thanks. Thank you so much.